Good morning, or good afternoon. Good afternoon. Everyone. My name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I am the chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. I want to thank you all here for this important hearing on diversity in cultural institutions and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs Workforce Demographics Pilot Study, Findings, Results, and Next Steps. Uh, as everybody here knows, it is always a busy day here at City Hall, and there is a major hearing going on next door, which I too need to check in at at some point because I am uh, a part of that committee as well. So members will be uh, coming and going throughout the hearing. Uh, but this city is known wide and far for its great racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity. And also, of course, as uh, one of, if not the, major cultural hubs of the world. And while diversity has been an integral part of many of the city's cultural offerings and our advances in the arts, uh, there is a lack of diversity in culture, in art, and institutions that has been widely noted. I will say that uh, our community is not the only community that faces these challenges, but the Department of Cultural Affairs and the cultural world writ large is thinking about these issues and acting on the findings. It's part of why we're having the hearing today. So as some folks know, obviously the commissioner knows, in January of 2015, DCLA launched a diversity initiative to study, promote, uh, and cultivate equitable representation among the leadership staff and audiences of cultural organizations in New York City. Uh, the first major project of the DEI initiative was to conduct a survey of demographics of the workforce of the 987, at that time, DCLA grantees in partnership with the research firm Ithaca SR. In January of 2016, DCLA released the results of this study, which found that the cultural workforce did not reflect the diversity of the city's population. In particular, the study found that the cultural workforce was 61.8% white, while less than a third of the city is comprised of non-Hispanic whites. This committee held a hearing on the results of the Ithaca SR study on February 25, 2016. In 2017, DCLA launched the city's first comprehensive cultural plan, Create NYC. Equity and inclusion uh, was and is one of the issue areas identified in the plan, which cited the results of the Ithaca study as, quote, troubling and included a number of objectives and strategies related to DEI. After the release of Create NYC, DCLA partnered with SMU Data Arts to conduct another pilot study on the demographics of the workforce of cultural institutions, the results of which were released in July of 2019. The SMU Data Arts study used different methodology from the Ithaca study in that it relied on self-reported responses of the cultural workers. But the results of the two studies were largely similar with respect to the racial and ethnic demographics of the workforce. However, the methodology of the SMU data art study allowed the collection of better information on disability and sexual orientation and gender identity. Today, we are here to explore the results of the 2019 SMU data arts pilot study, and the committee will seek to gain a deeper understanding of DCLA's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and the best practices to increase DEI in the cultural sector. I want to thank my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, the committee's finance analyst, Alia Ali, our policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, to my left, and our interim committee counsel, uh, Nell Beekman, who is stepping in for Brenda McKinney, who is away on family leave celebrating the birth of her daughter, Valencia. And also, Aminta Kilowan, who uh, served 
as our committee's counsel for uh, years before moving on is also here in a guest, special guest performance. Uh, uh, thank you, Aminta Kilowan. Um, so with that, I think we will swear in the commissioner. Uh, you, young man, do not have to raise your right hand uh, at this point, but the commissioner does, yes. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. You may hey. proceed, Commissioner, and then I presume after your testimony, we'll hear from? Yes, from Data Arts, from Mr. Fawner, and then yes. we'll entertain questions. Great. Okay. okay, good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. I'm here today to testify in regards to today's topic, diversity in the cultural institutions and New York City's Department of Cultural Affairs, workforce demographic, demographics, pilot study, findings, results, and next steps. Making our city's arts and culture institutions more welcoming and reflective of all New Yorkers has been a priority for the Department of Cultural Affairs since the start of this administration. To work towards this ideal, one of the core strategies we've, um, we're encouraging among our, constitu our constituents is increasing diversity in the cultural workforce. We believe that staffs encompassing a variety of voices ultimately create programs that speak to a variety of audiences. Before you can move forward on any ideal, you need to assess where you're starting. That's why in the fall of 2015, as Councilmember Van Bramer said, we commissioned a survey of every cultural nonprofit organization receiving support from the Department of Cultural Affairs. Using private funding, we selected research firm Ithaca SNR to collect demographic data from over 900 organizations and report on how diverse our city's cultural workforce actually was. This was the first study of its kind conducted in New York City cultural sector. The results were published in 2016. We found some data that were troubling, to say the least. Most concerning was the fact that, although two-thirds of New Yorkers identify as people of color, only around one-third of those working in arts and culture nonprofit jobs identified that way. On top of that, high-level jobs, the people curating collections and making decisions, were significantly whiter than lower-level supporting staff. The 2015 study gave us a great starting point. It sparked the launch of several new programs and efforts to address these challenges. For instance, working with Theater Subdistrict Council, we directed $3 million, over $3 million to training programs aimed at fostering a fairer, more inclusive theater workforce. Theater is an iconic cultural industry in New York City, but it faced particularly steep challenges outlined in the Ithaca report. CUNY Cultural Corps, which just kicked off its fourth year last year, has placed over 400 students into paid internships at cultural uh, groups. The Cultural Corps is aimed at squarely at the often refer referenced pipeline problem. It leverages CUNY's diverse student body to open up new, a uh, new pool of talent for cultural organizations. <clears throat> but as we dove deeper into thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we realized that we wanted a higher resolution snapshot of the cultural field. We also wanted to find ways to directly involve the cultural organizations we fund in these projects. So in 2018, we brought in the organization, now known as SMU Data Arts, whom you will hear from shortly. <clears throat> we worked with them to develop a demographic survey that would be distributed to a small subset of our organizations we fund as a pilot. This survey has two important features that make it particularly useful to us. First, it's a survey distributed directly to individual staff members, contractors, volunteers, and board members. The data is self-reported. The previous study relied on data from human resources records of each cultural institution. As a result, it did not capture statistically significant information about disability status, and it did not address sexual orientation at all. <clears throat> As an anonymous self-reported survey uh, can give us a much clearer picture of diversity uh, among these important axes. Uh, I'm not sure what that sound was. But... It was just the other room. The door opened. You're oh, the door opened. Okay, it's all good. that's the other hearing. Keep going. I'm, okay. Important work being done there as well. Second, the data arts process allowed individual cultural institutions to benefit from understanding their own organization along, the field, along with the field as a whole. We at DCLA would only receive a report containing aggregated data from the all surveyed institutions. However, if an individual, if a given organization had a level of participation that reached statistical significance, which you'll hear about in a minute, Data Arts would issue them their own organization-specific report. <clears throat> We're proud to say that SMU Data Arts collected nearly 7,000 responses to the survey. 
Many of the 65 organizations that participated in this pilot, including all 33 members of the Cultural Institutions Group, uh, accumulated enough response from their staff and volunteers to qualify for individual reports. This bodes well for the coming year when we will roll out the survey to all of our constituent organizations, over 1,000 arts and cultural nonprofits. You'll hear more about the process from Daniel uh, Fauner shortly. In addition, Data Arts has put together an analysis of the data from the pilot study, which we're happy to share and which is available on our website. I urge you to remember that this year's research is a pilot, so the results are preliminary. However, I do want to point out a few takeaways that we've been thinking about. For one thing, racial distribution of cultural workers in these organizations still skews to about two-thirds white non-Hispanic as compared to one-third NYC's population. Clearly, our work with this field is cut out for us in terms of increasing racial diversity, particularly in senior level positions. Now we have data about sexual orientation that we didn't know before. 15% of the surveyed workforce identifies as members of the LGBTQ community, and in leadership positions, that percentage increased to around 25%. We also have new data about people with disabilities who work in the arts and culture. The self-reporting aspect of this survey enabled us to discover that 8% of respondents identify as having a disability. Still, it's worth pointing out that even in an anonymous environment, questions about disability and sexual orientation each had 11% of respondents declining to state their status or identity. Why is that? This is one of the, main, of the many questions we hope to answer with further study and engagement with our constituents. You've heard me compare some of the results uh, from the study to the New York City population as a whole. But I want to emphasize that the demographics of our, our city, as reported in the census, serve only as a guidance and inspiration. We're not looking to impose quotas. Seeking diversity and equity in our field requires a much more nuanced conversation than that. This is especially important to remember when looking at individual organizations. Consider organizations whose mission is to preserve the ethnic heritage of a particular community, or highly localized organizations serving one specific neighborhood, or very small organizations. It makes no sense to demand that demographic profile of nonprofits like these should match that of the city as a whole. In addition, there's been some discussion of the new, in the news of certain populations being over, quote, overrepresented, end quote, in the cultural workforce. Let's take people with disabilities, for example. Yes, it is true that 8% of the study respondents who report having <coughs> one or more disabilities is greater than the 4% of New York City's total workforce who do so. But that 8% is less than the 11% of the city's entire population who identify as people having a disability. Rather than indicating overrepresentation, that statistic highlights another challenge. Certain groups, such as people with disabilities, are actually significantly underrepresented in the workforce as a whole. If the fields of arts and culture is doing the better than an average job of removing barriers to employment for members of these groups, then that's something to be proud of and to amplify. So now what? How do we move forward with this nuanced conversation? Where do we go now that the pilot study is complete? One important step is to broaden the pool of respondents, which we'll be doing in the coming year. That will establish our baseline and become a tool <clears throat> we can redeploy over time to monitor the progress of the field. I'd also like to share a few other programs and projects we're already working on uh, to help increase diversity in the cultural workforce. As promised in the Create NYC Cultural Plan, uh, we have required that members of the Cultural Institution Group to adopt diversity, equity, inclusion plans. We've worked closely with each CIG member to produce these plans that make sense for them, while also contributing to the goal of a more inclusive cultural sector. The resulting plans set customized benchmarks and increased accountability and will be reviewed annually. <clears throat> Incidentally, all of these institutions qualified to receive individual reports from Data Arts Survey. Several mentioned to us that these reports were invaluable tools in shaping meaningful diversity goals and strategies. We're also working with organizations outside the CAG as they strive to diversify their staffs. For example, in February, we partnered with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities to host Disability and Inclusion in the Cultural Workforce. This event drew over 150 people, running, uh, representing over 90 cultural organizations. Attendees learned about local, state, and regional uh, resources, offering support in developing more inclusive recruiting, hiring, and retention practices. This is the second such event we've held in an effort to address in some small way, the joblessness crisis in the disability community 
and we do not intend for this to be our last. <clears throat> in 2017 and 2018, the Theater Subdistrict Council, as I mentioned before, dedicated over $3 million to help increase diversity and opportunity in the theater workforce. The 2015 demographic study indicated that the theater industry was, frankly, less diverse than other areas of arts and culture. The TSC gave funding to 11 theater nonprofits uh, to begin to address this challenge. The organizations established fellowship programs for members of underrepresented populations, particularly people of color and people with disabilities. Several of these programs have continued even after the TSC funding ended. Another program offering opportunities to young people just starting their careers, the CUNY Cultural Course, continues to go strong. For the 2019-2020 school year, over 100 students from a variety of CUNY colleges are beginning paid internships with cultural institutions throughout the city. These internships are funded by the city with additional support from the Rockefeller Foundation and represent what a strong public-private partnership can accomplish. This spring, after just four years, a tremendously diverse group of nearly 450 students will have received excellent work experience in the cultural sector. They will have begun building solid professional networks, an essential compo component of career development, and they will have performed over 100,000 work hours at nonprofits in the cultural sector. This means that students will not have to choose between discovering careers in the arts and earning a paycheck. Data shows that employees at the lower rungs of cultural employment are a more diverse cohort. What can we do to nurture this talent? A newer partnership with CUNY, the Create NYC Leadership Accelerator, attempts to do this. The program, which is free of charge for the, participating, for the participants, thanks to city funding, provides professional development and leadership skills training to a diverse group of mid-career cultural professionals. By the end of this fiscal year, the program will have given over 100 future leaders invaluable tools and strategies they'll need <clears throat> as they extend their research, uh, their reach in their careers in the arts and cultural field. These are all steps on the journey towards a more inclusive cultural workforce, and we're not stopping. As a city and a society committed to fairness, we have an obligation to ensure that transformative social, intellectual, and emotional econo and economic benefits of art and culture are open to everyone. We at DCLA look forward to working with city council, our city agencies, and our constituent cultural organizations to achieve this. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss today's topic. Now we'll hear from Daniel Fawner of SMU Data Arts. Following that, I'm happy to answer questions that you may have. Feel free to go ahead, Daniel, but before that, I want to recognize Council Member Francisco Moya, a member of the Committee from Queens, has joined us. Good afternoon, Chan Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. My name is Daniel Fawner, and I am the Associate Director for Research at SMU Data Arts, the National Center for Arts Research at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. I offer my thanks to this committee and to the Department of Cultural Affairs for inviting me here today to testify about the pilot workforce demographics study conducted by SMU Data Arts on a subset of DCLA-funded organizations, including members of the Cultural Institutions Group. Over the past seven years, SMU Data Arts has conducted workforce demographics studies for governments, foundations, and service organizations across the country, collecting demographic information that includes employee heritage, age, gender, sexual orientation, and disability status. Through an iterative and reflective design process, SMU Data Arts regularly updates and refines our survey methodology, instrument, and reports to best capture the demographic characteristics of the arts and culture workforce. To ensure privacy of all respondents, our survey platform captures data anonymously, and our reporting standards prevent the identification of individual respondents. Prior to survey deployment for this pilot study in New York City on August 7, 2018, SMU Data Arts coordinated with DCLA to determine which organizations would participate. Once selected, a designated individual at each organization was tasked with providing SMU Data Arts with total workforce numbers for their organization and with emailing a URL to all employees, board members, and independent contractors, directing them to the survey. The survey, which takes about five minutes to complete, was open until October 2nd, 2018. 6,928 individuals affiliated with 65 arts and culture organizations participated in the study. 
allowing us to be 95% confident that our sample, in general, is representative of the total workforce of the participating organizations, with a margin of error of plus or minus 1%. Organizations that received a sufficient level of participation from their workforce were given a report that analyzed the demographics of their individual organization. Responses from all organizations were aggregated to create the pilot community report we are discussing today. In 2016, the firm Ithaca SNR conducted a similar demographic study on a much larger group of DCLA-funded organizations. While the Ithaca study provided valuable information on the demographics of the arts and culture workforce in New York City, the methodology employed in data collection reporting left unanswered questions. Topics such as disability status and sexual orientation were not fully explored, and some role in employment status choices led to some ambiguity in reporting. Most importantly, the methodology employed by Ithaca required a single person at each organization to fill out a spreadsheet that contained demographics for all employees. This method invites assumption into the data collection process, potentially misrepresenting the demographics of the workforce. To that end, while broad trends appear in both reports, it is not possible to compare the Ithaca study and the SMU Data Arts pilot study on a one-to-one -one basis. When reporting on workforce demographic data, we strive to provide benchmark information for organizations and policymakers to draw comparisons and make informed decisions. We provide context to the data collected by comparing it to standard demographic data, such as data from the Census Bureau. In cases where the Census does not collect certain data, we compare data to other reputable research in the field. The demographic analysis provided by SMU Data Arts is not prescriptive. We do not make recommendations on what should be done. We simply aim to capture and report on many aspects of demographics. Primary findings from this study include, in terms of gender identity, board and executive leadership closely match the makeup of New York City, with other roles leaning more female. With regard to sexual orientation, 15% of respondents identified as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, compared to 4% of the New York, Newark, Jersey City metro area. Regarding heritage, 66% of the arts and culture workforce identified as white and non-Hispanic compared to 32% in the general population. All other races and ethnicities, included, including Asian, Black, and Hispanic, were represented in the arts and culture workforce at less than half the prevalence occurring within the general population. Respondents identifying their role as community engagement most closely mirrored census data. In terms of disability status, 8% of respondents identified as having a disability, compared to 11% in the general New York City population. Census definitions around disability status include those who are in the labor force, both employed and unemployed, and those in the general population. The census definition of the labor force only captures those uh, not, who are non-volunteers and are aged 20 to 64. It is more appropriate to compare against the general population in the context of this study, which included both volunteers and those over age 64. In our study, 16% of respondents and 32% of boards, which are voluntary positions by nature, were over the age 64. And 19% of respondents identified as non-board volunteers. The results of this pilot study show similar trends to other studies conducted by SMU Data Arts in cities such as Los Angeles and Houston particularly in relation to racial and ethnic identity and gender makeup of arts and culture workforces. While we view this study as successful, we always look for ways to improve our survey and our reports. Since the completion of this study, we have updated our questions and definitions for sexual orientation and gender identity, improved our statistical methods for determining participation thresholds, and added questions to probe employee workplace perceptions related to well-being and psychological safety. Additionally, we are currently testing a potential question to distinguish between incidence and prevalence of demographic characteristics within a workforce. SMU Data Arts aims to build a national culture of data-driven decision-making for those who want to see the arts and culture sector thrive. Data without context of place, time, and community understanding is irrelevant at its best and misleading and destructive at its worst. We at SMU Data Arts aim to provide our partners and the arts and culture sector in general with objective data, insights, and tools to empower them to make informed decisions to better serve their communities. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you um, for your testimony, uh, and thank you for your uh, 
commitment to including sexual orientation and gender identity more. Uh, as a gay man, I can tell you that uh, the gays love the arts. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> very important that you include us. Um, having uh, said that, obviously we have some questions for uh, the commissioner um, in particular. So, I guess I would start off by saying to you, what do you think is the most disturbing finding and in how are we going to address that which you think is the most disturbing finding in these surveys? Well, I mean, I think that the, you know, they continue, as Mr. Fani just said, to be these big discrepancies, particularly around race and uh, ethnic identity. Uh, in the cultural workforce. And I think, you know, we've already taken a whole bunch of steps. I outlined those before. I think that the, um, you know, you're going to hear from the cultural institution group who have all now developed diversity, equity, inclusion plans with goals uh, that have been vetted and accepted by us as being um, legitimate plans. So I think, it, you know, this is the big uh, challenge. I think that keeping the doors open to, um, Folks that, you know, like LGBTQ folks that have found a good employment within this sector is extremely important. But I do think it, you know, just on the face of it, it's pretty clear that the biggest challenge remains um, what was just mentioned in the, in the testimony, those terrible discrepancies. So, so if... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Yep. So if, if uh, the racial and ethnic... Uh, uh, diversity is so far behind that of the city, what specific plans does the administration have to address that? Um, I know one time it was at least discussed tying this to funding, mm -hmm. right? Yes. That there would be a, a, uh, a percentage of a, an applicant uh, that was tied in terms of their funding to achieving uh, uh, goals associated with uh, diversity. Um, is that still yes. <clears throat> uh, something the administration is open to pursuing? I'm trying to get at, so we, we've done two studies now. I know that you're going to expand this pilot mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to all the groups, but we've done two studies that have come up with basically the same finding. Um, and, and what specifically is the administration doing to address it? So uh, what you're referring Other to- Other than studying it some more, but- No, no, yeah, but no, but the studies are super important, and I think that the individual information that the groups have gotten out of this study is important. I've heard from cultural organizations, for example, that they didn't know how many people with disabilities are working on their workforce, and that's important for them to know. There's 8% of their, or eight, I can't remember the exact number, 8% overall that to make it possible for those folks to be fully productive, it's important to know that. So again, what you're referring to, and again, this is a, a moment. We were sitting there together with the mayor, the announcement of the cultural plan, which, as everybody in the room knows, was a bill sponsored by the chairman. Um, that we sat there uh, at that moment and said, and it was quite clearly stated, that we are going to be asking the Cultural Institutions Group, which is the group which we invest the most heavily in, uh, to develop diversity, equity, inclusion plans with goals that are measurable that we're going to hold them accountable to, uh, or to face this possible dim diminution of their uh, subsidy from the city. That's still the case. That first threshold or, or the first moment of that question has been called right now, which is, we have, all of these groups have now developed diversity, equity, inclusion plans that they have submitted to us. They were reviewed by our legal team, led by a civil rights attorney who's very well-versed and has read a million of these plans in her day. Um, so those, the first threshold has been reached. Nobody got their funding cut because they all submitted diversity, equity, inclusion plans with goals that will be um, administered or uh, reviewed on an annual basis. A lot of these groups are already taking action. It's not simply, and by the way, I, I think it's important to say we continue to do the research. We think research is valuable. I, we think we're working with, with uh, one of the top, by the way, nothing wrong with SNR. They did a great job. They do a lot of good research other places in the city. We felt the methodology used by data arts and the more inclusive methodology was a better way to measure. 
we're going to continue to do surveys. It's not that that's all we're doing. Simultaneous to that, in a way that hasn't been done in any other city, we are working very closely with our cultural institutions to ensure that they're making progress on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, uh, all, all that is, is uh, terrific, I hear that, but while the, the new information on, on uh, disability and sexual orientation may be new uh, to the heads of institutions or organizations, um, you know, the, the, the racial and ethnic uh, breakdown of, of the staff and senior staff uh, may have been more uh, um, apparent uh, within these organizations, so that may be less surprising, the findings of both studies. So I guess, and I'm not advocating for this, but it's the mayor himself who said that if some of these groups don't start um, uh, showing progress here, they, as you just said, the administration is still open to uh, a diminution of their funds, as yep. you said. That's what I said. So I guess, Correct. I guess the question is then when yep. and at what point uh, is this administration and your department open to cutting people's budgets because they're not reaching, well, you tell me, like what goal and when and where? Okay, so yeah, so the answer to that question is the next threshold is gonna be next spring. These diversity, equity, inclusion plans that you're gonna hear about from the, the CIGs um, are gonna be reviewed on an annual basis. These plans have one year, three year, and five year, or is it six year, uh, thresholds. Um, so they have you know, short, medium, and long term thresholds. A lot of the organizations have set themselves very specific kinds of goals. Those kind of goals are different from organization to organization. And I think that that's very important. We are in the beginning of a phase in New York City where cultural institutions are really taking this, Not and by the way, plenty of cultural organizations have been working on this for a long period of time. I, I don't wanna, it was very important to me in Queens, you know that, and lots of cultural organizations around the city. I think to institutionalize it, to have these plans to have a, um, is as a whole new phase. It, there's a lot of research about what kind of cultural uh, diversity, equity, inclusion plans bear the most fruit or the most successful. It's not clear what that is. We have a, a diversity of diversity plans, but I'm just to answer your question quite literally because you asked for a date. Next spring, they're going to be all reporting to us and that's the next time we're gonna be looking at these cultural organizations and what kind of progress they're making on their diversity plans. And and because uh, you mentioned in your testimony that there aren't quotas, uh, as you're measuring that progress in the next reports, um, are you simply looking for progress or are you, are you do you have benchmarks or, or numbers that you're looking for? But again, it, it's, it, it's different from cultural organization to cultural organization. Perfect. And again, it is a very different uh, question to ask for a culturally explicit organization um, or an organization that serves a very specific geographical community. Um, so again, there are different kinds of thresholds that are being, that where these cultural organizations are gonna be holding themselves accountable and we're gonna be holding them accountable for. What we will have as we continue to do research and we continue to do our uh, data arts surveys over the next years is a aggregate statistic of how the, the cultural community is doing in relationship diversity cumulatively, and that's what I think is the most important, not to reach quotas at an individual organization, but to have diversity is a goal, and there are lots of great creative, right in your district, create, a PS1 has said, we're getting rid of unpaid internships. That has been a detriment to diversity in a lot of cultural organizations. And that's like, it's starting already, it's already happened. Folks who can't afford to volunteer their time are now not gonna have that barrier to working at PS1 Contemporary Arts Center. So there's examples like that all throughout the city. Um, and we're waiting to see, you know, from now, we've just gone through this big effort, 500 pages of reports that we've read through, that, that the cultural organizations have submitted. I think it's a very exciting moment in that history of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the city. Um, so have you briefed the mayor directly on these uh, reports? So I haven't briefed him on this report, but we have definitely talked. This is a subject very close to the heart of the mayor. This is something I've talked to him on numerous occasions about. 
Uh, I haven't sat down and, and shown the results of SMU data arts yet. So, so you've not talked about uh, this particular study, which came out in July? Correct. Um, and uh, in your previous, I guess, discussions uh, with the mayor, what does he want to see happen here? Because you may have your own ideas about what should happen here and what specific plans the department should have working with the cultural organizations. Um, but but you, you may not be able right, to fully so implement all of that without the mayor actually uh, signing off on those things. Yeah, I mean, so look, we, we, uh, he understands the general direction we're going in. We've talked about it. We've talked about the idea of these, these plans, uh, executing the plans, monitoring the plans year to year. He's really left it in the hands of, of us to implement. So general direction, enthusiasm, thumbs up. This is an important thing for the uh, agency under this administration. And again, but allowed the uh, sort of structure of it to be designed by the agency. We have uh, been talking to other cultural agencies around America. We've been talking to our cultural institutions about how to execute this, but he's really left it in our hands. Uh, it's not micromanaged by the mayor, but it is enthusiastically embraced by him. Have you uh, briefed, uh, is it Deputy Mayor Vicki Bean? Yes. On oh, yes, absolutely, yep. A particular yep. study? Yep. Uh, so are you frustrated by the, the lack of progress or the, the persistence no. of some of these numbers? No, I'm not. I'm, so I'm inspired by the way that the cultural sector is embracing this. And look, uh, we, we have seen in Mellon, for example, national survey, progress is being made in the cultural sector. That's true, I believe, in New York City, but we're going to prove it with actual statisticians at our side. Um, I see it anecdotally, one organization after the next. And again, there's diversity in the cultural sector, what's important to us. And by the way, I don't want to in any way, and I'm sure you're at my side with this, diminish the importance of those union jobs of maintenance and security. Those are important jobs at institutions that are part of the backbone. Uh, I'm, but I'm saying, we want to see diversity in the decision-making process, in the curators, in the programmers. Um, as Mr. Foner said, that the, 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 the part of the organization that most closely um, matches the city is community engagement. So, but there's incredibly talented people. I've met them. They're at CUNY, some of them now. They're future leaders. Or there's those folks who have been our leadership accelerator, and I've met all of them. Um, who are ready to go and take on these positions. It is happening. I, I'm not frustrated, I'm inspired by it, but we have to keep pushing. And I think it's good having hearings like this and getting us all together on a regular basis is important. I, th I believe progress is being made. So if we acknowledge what you just did, sort of one of the, the biggest issues that we confront are senior leadership and, and even board positions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and. Uh, and that screams to uh, you know uh, the need for a pipeline, right? A real um, incubator of talent. And, and um, is is the CUNY core that which you see as being the primary vehicle for um, uh, achieving that? Or what is what is the best way to achieve diversity at the highest levels? Whether it's the directors, artistic directors, CEOs. Um, those sorts of positions. So, I mean, look, I think the CUNY Cultural Corps is a long-term proposition. Uh, I've met a lot of these people. A lot of these people have fantastic, you know, experiences at CUNY Cultural Corps, and they, they're still going off to med school or something terrible like that. I'm kidding about that. But you know what I'm saying? It's not all, <clears throat> it's, what a waste of talent somebody to become a doctor. Um, I see the uh, Leadership Accelerator as something that's much more immediate. These are people in cultural organizations who are already employed, who need to uh, understand that the mechanisms of getting up through that uh, and not being stopped at some kind of glass ceiling along the way. So I think leadership accelerator is extremely important. I also think it's not just us doing this. There are all kinds of um, <clears throat> professional development opportunities at institutions, and there are also other funders. Mellon has been working on this, these kind of issues for a 
generation, if you look at the number of people with PhDs in art history of color who currently have professorial jobs across the country who have profited from that melon pipeline development, it's, it's really inspiring to see. So again, I want CUNY Cultural Corps to have thousands of graduates. I'm a CUNY, proud CUNY graduate myself. I want the CUNY students to have that, but that's by far our, not only the only uh, mechanism we're using. And again, there's a lot of different uh, avenues to that, but I, I do see lots of experiments happening across the cultural sector. Um, I, I have some more questions, but a number, another member of our uh, committee mm. has uh, joined us and I know has some questions on this topic and has some experience. Uh, with this issue, uh, so I want to ask uh, Lori Cumbo uh, to say a few words and ask her questions as well. Thank you, Chair Bramer. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to start off by thanking you for your support of Weeksville Heritage Society, and we're very happy that we were able to come to an agreement with Chair Van Bramer and myself and many of the faces that I see here today. So I certainly want to thank you for that because that was a long-fought battle, and we're glad that we were able to come to a resolution or a meeting of the minds and that you all were able to see things my way. <laughs> 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 Just wanted to start off with um, gaining an understanding as, as you know, as Councilmember Van Bramer alluded to, that I have some experience in this area where I've lived um, this experience. How do you foresee the work that's being done in terms of diversifying our institutions, impacting uh, culturally specific uh, institutions. So many of the smaller organizations that recruit, train, develop, create these wonderful uh, professionals, seeing the, the work that's being done to almost recruit uh, professionals of color into the larger institutions, it becomes almost a creative brain drain in terms of utilizing the talent that many of the smaller organizations who have done the work uh, to train these individuals. How do you feel the work that you're doing impacts those culturally uh, smaller institutions that certainly just can't compete with the benefits, the packages, the health insurance, the potential to have all of these other things, and of course, an, an increase in salary? So look, first of all, I acknowledge uh, Congratulations to everybody around Weeksville. That's a beautiful moment. But uh, I think at the, there, what you're talking about, first of all, uh, I think at making the pie bigger. In other words, making, having a pipeline that is very diverse, that has a lot of different pipes going into it, not just organizations. And by the way, the, the brain drain I understand what you're talking about. It's also a small to large organization brain drain in general, right? So there are people who go to small cultural institutions, culturally specific or not, who are then recruited by bigger institutions. That's something that's been happening for a long period of time. I think that happens in many different sectors of the economy, in the corporate economy as well. But if we talk about this idea of having a larger um, pie or just a larger workforce ready to go uh, that's very diverse, then it's not going to have to be a situation of, let's say, cherry picking from small culturally explicit organizations. But also say that there are some culturally explicit organizations who have made that, in a way, part of the mission of the organization is to, um, to create opportunities for people to go into the workforce elsewhere. But I've also seen, and I think this is something uh, that is n maybe newer, more often happening now, Folks who simply are saying, I'm committed to working uh, uh, long term and staying within the community that I uh, has, you know, that is my community. So folks who have said, who have the, the opportunity to be recruited elsewhere, who are simply saying, I don't uh, any longer aspire to go to this other place. I see that happening much more often. So I, look, this is a problem uh, that's been around for a long time that board members have been a recruited or poached or whatever you want to say from smaller to larger organizations. But I do think that the, um, the um, 
focus on, on diversity uh, and on the uh, strength of the uh, cultural sector as a whole. Some of the ways that we've been able to put extra funding into lower income communities uh, throughout through uh, cultural plan initiatives uh, means that I am concerned about the issue that you're talking about, but I think that there are alternatives. And the biggest alternative is to say, you big cultural institution who, needs to, uh, who has a new imperative to fire, hire a diverse workforce, which is a good thing, has a variety of places to look that aren't just the traditionally culturally explicit organizations. I hear you. I think that part of what I'm hearing on the ground from many of the smaller institutions is how can Department of Cultural Affairs work to create an overall, let's say for the 900 or so institutions, how do we create a universal health plan that would be able to bundle uh, a workforce across the big to the smaller institutions so that things that level the playing field like healthcare, like pension, like all of these different things that would be ways to create, because at the end of the day, someone working at a smaller cultural institution that decides to go on to the Metropolitan Museum of Art or others are in some ways making a choice of their health care or making a choice of many different things. So is there any way in terms of a baseline as far as like uh, circumstances that could be bundled resources from health care and others and even what we did with the utility relief program, like something that allows us to recognize that we have this workforce of 900 plus institutions and however many people that calculates into, how can we start to see these as a workforce that is protected in many ways so that people aren't making a choice to leave one institution over the other for life or death uh, needs or situations so that people can get health care, paid family leave, maternity, you know, all these different sorts of things that one would need. So, you know, over the years there have been some attempts to do this, mm -hmm. which is this idea okay. of um, a sort of collectively funded uh, risk pool for insurance, right? So, I, but I haven't actually, and so there were some experiments around that, which were bearing some fruit, which actually, as I understand it, and maybe I'll have to get back to, we could talk further about this, kind of went away with Obamacare. Mm -hmm. That as soon as there was a low-cost alternative for people to buy their own insurance that didn't take into account pre-existing conditions and all that kind of stuff, that those experiments went away. And look, we have a situation, we'll see who's you know, in the White House next or whatever, that where there's a lot of you know, idea of creating a more robust uh, uh, health insurance situation for everybody. But, you know, that has been experimented with, but I don't, under, I don't know of any experiments of that nature occurring in New York City right now. Uh, there's all kinds of questions of how, how it would work financially, but as I understand it, most of those experiments kind of ended uh, with about 10 years ago. Does the um, CUNY Cultural Corps, does it have anything beyond the internship or the... Um the ability to connect one to an institution. Is there, for example, a curriculum across the board with the rollout of Cultural Corps that incorporates, it's more than an internship. Mm -hmm. So for me, I went to NYU for a degree in visual arts administration. And then there are other programs like that at Pratt where I connected with you um, in the arts and cultural management program. So I know that these types of programs exist in the private school sector, but are there these types of programs through cultural corps that talks about arts administration, cultural programming, finance and development for a cultural institution, everything from sound and engineering for a theater group. Are these types of degrees being developed on the CUNY level outside of the internship? So you're going to hear about one of those in a minute okay. from a partner, from a CUNY partner. Um, what you're talking about is much more like what we do in the Leadership Accelerator, not the CUNY Cultural Corps. CUNY Cultural Corps now is more than an internship. They have, the program is, is maturing enough that they have, uh, people have gone through the program who are helping mentor the students who are just fresh to the program, but it's not 
what you're talking about. You're talking about is much closer to the uh, leadership accelerator, which is to say, okay, you are in a job, um, here's how this sector works. Right. Uh, here's how you're going to be able to make your way, creating social networks amongst a diverse group of young professionals. There you go. Yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah, we could show you the curriculum for that. It's an intensive. It's but how paid expansive for is that, and how many people is that reaching? So we have classes. Each class is about 35 people. Mm -hmm. We did two last year. So it's like, a, you know, we, we will have had 100 students through that. But again, we want to make this a long-term proposition so that every year uh, we can <clears throat> um, be developing talent. What, what we are here about in a minute, I think, is this new uh, uh, CUNY um, arts administration program, right. which is one. And, you know, the, and Pratt is a fantastic school, <clears throat> as is, and you went to NYU for mm -hmm. a day. So, but the public option, meaning CUNY, is one that's not associated with student debt, that has a much more diverse uh, first cohort. I think that first class is this year. So there is progress being made in that direction. I think that's <clears throat> really the way to expand a program like that, because the internship field, that's good in terms of an entree, but you really need the, the development of a major where you really get to explore a field <clears throat> to be competitive. And so out of a conflict that you share, I'll be general about this. Is there a way to change the dynamics so that we're able to hire people as curators, as administrators, without the same level of degree or scholarship that's needed because you have an incredible breadth of experience, mm -hmm. that you are an artist that's worked successfully for over 40 years, that you have done something. I'll give you an example. I'm throwing these names out because they're names that we both know, but I have no idea if they're interested in something <clears throat> like this. But let's say, I don't even know what degrees he has, a Chester Higgins Jr. that worked for the New York Times for 40 years. Mm. If he wanted to be a chief curator at a X, Y, and Z museum, but did not have a doctorate degree in photography, but had done the work on that level, or a Danny Simmons, who's been on every board, who's worked in every institution in some way, shape, form, or fashion, becoming a chief curator at the Museum of Modern Art, although he does not have a doctorate in mm -hmm. whatever one. Is there a way to change how we hire people based off of experiences versus just the, if you don't have a PhD, you cannot be in this higher level of administration here in this particular institution, which I think is what's stopping so many people from acquiring these jobs where, of course, just like the names I threw out, you'd be like, that's a no-brainer. They should absolutely be that person. So, I mean, I think this is a question that is being pondered at these institutions, that these institutions, and there aren't that many institutions that actually require a PhD. Some do, and, and we're talking about uh, fine arts institutions, which have required PhDs in art history. For, for a long period of time. There are different kinds of qualifications. Again, I don't want to uh, just, it's not just fine arts. We have what's going on at the, at the Bronx Zoo in terms of like a graduate PhD in, in biology or whatever. So there is this question, and this is a question in our own hiring practices in the city mm -hmm. as well, which is to say, what is the qualification that is the most important qualification for this job is not necessarily a diploma. Uh, I will say that what is happening again in the art history profession is a serious and prolonged focus on diversity within the graduate programs. So that idea that you couldn't find somebody with a PhD in that particular uh, branch of art history is no longer going to be the case. So I think that that is already happening. There's this upward spiral of uh, folks with PhDs who are much more diverse. Um, I'm not going to reveal it, but I just had a discussion this morning about somebody who's going to become a curator in a museum who does, who is an African-American woman who has a PhD. I'm just saying this is happening all the time. You discussed it early this morning? Before I went to work, yes. Oh, that's great. It's the only time I could find. I, yes, I, okay. I 
I have a follow-up. So, because I was going to ask this question in my next round, but it yeah. pertains to what uh, was just said. So you, uh, you've been the commissioner for roughly six years or so. Um, when uh, there have been a lot of openings, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we've just had a lot of movement in the city, uh, folks uh, moving across the country and becoming director of a different museum or uh, transitions. Are you happy with the progress that you've seen in terms of the, the hiring of, of new folks? And do you and the administration have any role or input? Uh, so when, you know, we're not going to single anyone out, but when yep. uh, X institution has an opening, there's a mm -hmm. nationwide search and all this great stuff is happening, uh, to what extent are you involved, consulted, sure. and are you happy with how these boards are, are handling this and coming through with a more progressive and uh, diverse group of leaders? So um, you have to understand that 20 years ago, the biggest issue, not the biggest, one of the issues that was presented in these cultural institutions was gender diversity. A lot of women have come into powerful positions in New York City. I think New York City is an exemplar of that. Across the nation, as I understand it, and you might have some of these statistics, um, women are directors of about half the cultural institutions, but not the big ones. So when you have New York City now, where the Brooklyn Museum, the, um, the garden, you know, the New York Botanical Garden, Museum of Natural History, those, you know, this is good progress in terms of gender diversity that just isn't the case elsewhere, um, which I'm happy. But just to get to your question about what kind of role I take, and I'll just say very clearly, I don't get involved in the individual hiring of individual directors. I'm often called by headhunters, and I will not talk about individual people. I will talk about the cultural institution, my knowledge of the cultural institution, their past. I'm on 38 boards. I'm very well aware of those cultural institutions, their needs, their future, et cetera. I express my opinions. I do not get involved in individual hiring decisions at cultural institutions. I, I will you know, not answer questions about individual candidates. I don't think it's my role to do that. Um, I think that the boards have uh, created the opportunities for more diverse finalists in a lot of these uh, institutions. Um, so I'm saying that a lot of progress has been made. Uh, and if you look at the statistics, again, in terms of gender, it's been pretty good. Not pretty good, very good. And uh, again, where we haven't seen the progress. Look, uh, I know, again, because I'm on the, all these boards and I understand, I've never, I'm never on a search committee, but search committees often are reporting back to the entire board, and so I'm, I understand. I absolutely believe that there has been a more diverse pool of candidates uh, in terms of uh, racial uh, composition than in the past. And I think that's inevitably going to lead to a more diverse group of directors in the future. So I do think that there's a lot of progress there. Just a um, So uh, before I turn it back over to my colleague, um, yes, I, I, I think there's progress, and I, and I know you care about this, and, and as do many folks, and having the finalist pool be more diverse racially is great, um, and uh, believing that ultimately that will lead to more uh, breakthroughs is uh, sort of aspirational um, and, and very hopeful, uh, but the question is, how soon uh, and when. Agreed. And, but I have to say also that, that the senior level positions at a lot of these institutions are already being populated with a much more diverse group. If you have all of a sudden a senior management team that includes a general counsel or a deputy director, these are kinds of people that end up in the very powerful positions. Sometimes they get uh, moved over to, uh, or, or you know, hunted by another, headhunted by another cultural institution. So I think that the, um, the movement up through institutions is also happening. Turn it back over to my colleague. <clears throat> Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on three things. 
One was when you talked about the, um, the funding for the, the theater subdistrict council um, gave funding to 11 theater nonprofits to begin to address this challenge. The organizations established fellowship programs for members of underrepresented populations, et cetera. Is this um, funding that's going to continue year after year? Was this a one shot or how is this going to be managed? This is a two shot, not a one shot. Okay. And by the way, in your district, there was a coalition between Mokata, Brick, and BAM, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. So there, this is happening all over the city. I do want to make one amendment to my testimony. This is the only place where we actually fund for-profits as well. So you just have to be associated with theater. So there's like TKTS got one mm -hmm. of these. I don't think that's a nonprofit. In any case, um, maybe it is. The, um, we had two funding cycles within the theater sub-district council, awarded these grants twice. Right now we don't have any money in the pot. Theater Subdistrict Council is, um, it's not in cultural affairs, although I am the chairman of the board. Uh, it is based on selling air rights in the theater district. Its mission is to enrich the theater life of the city and has to, you know, circle back to the theater district at some level. But if you're training lighting technicians, you're training, um, by the way, unions have been very involved in that as well. Um, the Stagehand Union, which has not been that diverse, is got a fantastic training program for diverse young New Yorkers. Um, so that, uh, we are waiting to get more money. But somebody has to sell some air rights. That, uh, just a, that's not an annual, it's not tax levy. It's the transfer of air rights. When those sales happen in the theater district, uh, a percentage goes to this funding. It's just an understanding of you and I both know how long it takes to actually cultivate something that has some impact and meaning to it. Um, just want to close with, I, I think the thing that I'm hearing that I'm most concerned with is what we spoke about initially, and it's just how culturally specific institutions are going to fare while this campaign or movement to diversify our larger institutions grow. And I don't exactly know the solution to it, but I know that smaller culturally specific institutions have many of the same challenges that our larger institutions have in terms of recruiting staff that's trained, that uh, has a degree or experience in this level of work. It's equally as hard to find those individuals and to um, add to that to retain them. I think that one of the one of the ideas that I've thought about is to, how do you create stronger partnerships with the larger organizations and the smaller culturally specific institutions so that there is a way to be able to, oh, these are not the right words, but to share staff, mm -hmm. to share boards, to share resources, to share exhibitions, to share programming, to recognize the benefits that both of them have, whereas one is more on the ground and probably closer to the community and closer to the next generation of who's gonna be the next Wageshi Mutu or Kehinde Wiley that are working with those individuals. It's funny because I saw the photograph of Wageshi Mutu at the Met today when I was cleaning out uh, my apartment trying to make heads or tails, I saw a photograph of Wageshi with my dad at Mokata helping to hang up her work 20 years ago. Yep. So it's like how that transition goes, um, some way to be able to connect these institutions so that they're not competing, but that they are training and growing and sharing resources in a way that is beneficial to both. Yep. Has that been thought of? Again, you know, I think it, there's, uh, this is not the first time that this has been brought up. Obviously, this is something that's been of concern. Um, I have to say that there's an analogy I've been thinking of as you've been speaking about this, which has to do with the historically black colleges and universities. That when integration happened across the nation at other schools, students were then who went to Howard last generation, might be going to Harvard, right? But those colleges are doing pretty well, a lot of them. Uh, you know that Mary Schmidt Campbell went down to be the head of Spelman College. That's where I went. 
There you go. There you go. All right. So you got excellence coming out of Spelman. But you know what she's been doing in terms of training young professionals at Spelman to enter the cultural workforce. Obviously, Mary is a PhD in art history herself. So that that is a, um, a place that has a student body that wants to be at that college, uh, given the choice now of other employment opportunities, I mean, uh, educational, educational opportunities. opportunities. I'm mm -hmm. seeing that happen with uh, talented young people of color uh, who are saying, I want to work at this cultural institution because this is where it is most meaningful for me to be, and I'm not going to be recruited out of here to another place because this is the place that I'm most... The question then is strengthening those institutions, continuing to strengthen those institutions, and again, we have pumped millions of dollars into low-income communities using the maps created by the social impact of the arts, another piece of research we did with a private sector. So I'm not sure that that fully answers your question, but we're definitely thinking about it. But this. it touches on an important point because I feel that a large part of this is also the historically black colleges could be an incredible, but it's not as if anyone was directing me to go into that field. I just so happened to not fare well in my political science major, nor in my educational yeah. minor, yeah. and so I found myself in art history, which is where I really wanted to be at first. Um, I'm gonna make a broad stereotype or generalization in that in many, I'll just say in many black communities, going to a private, historically black college, I don't think it's every parent's dream to sit for your child to come home and say, I want to be an art major or a sculptor or a writer or, you know, these are not fields that our families paying for a college like Spelman, $45,000, $50,000 a year at this point now, people aren't going to, so if somehow a marketing thing could be done in some ways to say there is this profession, they want you, there is a salary associated with it, you will make money, you will not be starving, you will, there's a field that wants you. So if you were to come into a school, you would know that this is a growing sector and a field that actually wants students in that way because at that time, I don't think I would have necessarily majored in African art with the desire to think that I could become a curator at a major institution that we're all familiar with, right? I wouldn't have thought that that was possible, but now I know. I could have been at that institution versus sitting here today. So it's one of those things that you know we really have to think about how we utilize our historically black colleges and recruit and openly let it be known that there is a place for you in this world. This is not just some highfalutin feel that a few people get to do. This is something everyone can do. And that's it. So and I'll just say one. So I do think that's what CUNY Cultural Corps is. We're exposing hundreds and hundreds of CUNY students to this opportunity to say, this is a job. This is a job that has a salary and a professional uh, outcome which could include you as a CUNY student. I just want to say that's great, and it's a great first step, but that internship is not going to allow you necessarily with the degree you're getting to become the chief curator at that institution. So it's how do we marry that CUNY program with the realities that so much of this field is based off of the level of professional degree, you, educational degree that you have. That's all. Thank you. Um, I just want to have uh, one, one or two more questions for the commissioner. So um, we know that we have uh, an issue with diversity, particularly at the senior most levels. Uh, yes, there's some progress being made. Um, and and yet there's still so much left to do, and the administration is gonna uh, broaden the pilot uh, mm -hmm. and, and do some more studying. Yep. Um, and, and yet there's this, uh, this sort of a looming threat of a, 
of a reduction in funding if, if uh, uh, goals aren't met. So I guess, do you think that's the best approach? And is there any concern, because even your studies show that, that uh, the, the diversity increases if there's lower wage employees, uh, involved in some of these positions mm -hmm. uh, where you see uh, the most diversity. And, you know, in my experience, when budgets get cut, it's, it's rare that the top executives uh, um, uh, cut their salaries, but sometimes the, the folks uh, at the lower end of the wage mm -hmm. uh, earning situation are the ones who get hurt. So. Talk to me a little bit about that, because if we're talking about, we know we've got an issue, we're going to study it some more, we've got some, some, some plans, uh, but the, the, the thing that's sort of looming out there is this, is this you know, uh, potential penalty, if you will, um, uh, and, and uh, do you, as the Commissioner of Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, representing the mayor, I think that that's the best approach. And and is there any fear that you're actually going to be hurting some of the very uh, goals that you're aspiring to here by diminishing organizations' funding? Okay, I hear you saying so. I yes, yeah, so yes, I do think it's the best route. I think we've thought very carefully about this. That uh, look, we've been very collaborative with these groups. We have been working very closely. You're going to hear from them, you can ask them this direct question. Um, we feel that there being uh, some skin in the game was something that we had to do. That we had to say that we take this seriously. I think these groups were already on this course, but I think it was a valuable thing to say, this is how important it is to us. Time, you know, and again, we're, we haven't just been studying, we've been taking action. But this is something that's been discussed over and over again for years. You know, like when are we going to see um, the actual, you know, wh what's your plan? So now we have the plans. And I think that these organizations, again, very, very, they really dove into it. You know, the way that they involved the entire staff from top to bottom of organizations <clears throat> um, in a very inclusive way, I think it was really inspiring to watch. That discussion isn't going away. People know that that discussion has happened. So we, our goal is not to cut these groups. Our goal is to have action taken. But I think that having a stick was something that we think was a valuable aspect of it. It's something that we talked over you know, at some length with the mayor, et cetera, that um, we intend to work closely. And again, the goal is that everybody uh, you know, is working towards these goals, is making you know, real and substantial commitment to the plans, and that's what we expect to happen. <clears throat> okay, uh, much more to be had, but we want to actually hear from some of the uh, cultural organizations that you're dangling that stick in front of, uh, Commissioner Finkel Pearl. Um, so why don't we hear from uh, some of those folks affected. Uh, I know Keith Stubblefield is here representing the Cultural Institutions Group members. Um, and Stephanie Wilchfort of the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Is Lisa Gold here uh, rep representing Asian American Arts Alliance? And do we only have three seats or we have four seats? We have four seats and Rosalind Barber from the public theater. Is Rosalind from the public? Yep, great. We'll have four, and then we have one more panel, uh, four speakers, and uh, the second panel as well. Okay, who wants to start? 
Yes, and you'll have to pull the microphone uh, towards you there, Keith, and turn it on with the red light on. You. Council Member Van Bramer, proceed. thank you. Nice to see you, Council Member Cumbo, as always. <clears throat> Thanks for the opportunity to testify. We're ready. Um, my name is Keith Stubblefield. I'm here to testify uh, today on behalf of BAM, a member of the Cultural Institutions Group, and I'll be reporting on the impact of the DCLA diversity study, the Create NYC plan, and the creation of DEI plans by each of the 33 CIGs. As public institutions who receive funding through the DCA, the members of the CIG each take the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion very seriously and have endeavored to center this work at the core of our activities. A significant undertaking has been the creation of individual DEI plans, which, the institution spent, which each institution spent months crafting with the input of their entire staff's communities and boards. Each institution in every borough created a unique and, and specific six-year plan. The plans include steps to make spaces more accessible, create more inclusive marketing plans, diversify and grow our audiences, and create more inclusive and welcoming spaces. The plans focus not only on recruiting and hiring diverse employees, but also on developing them and building a diverse pipeline for management, leadership, and board roles. Each organization will implement measures to ensure the efforts are sustained and experience informs subsequent work. These plans will help our audiences better reflect the diverse and vibrant demographics of the city and help ensure that the work we do is responsive, timely, and vital. The creation of these plans required critical staff work and many hours of research, collaboration, and work from each institution. Uh, BAM's own plan was developed over six months and, and included the input of over 250 staff members. The level of staff commitment and engagement was unprecedented in our institution, and resources put towards the project were drawn from our operating budget and from funds set aside specifically for this work. <clears throat> Excuse me. BAM also engaged a consultant who assisted in the creation of the plan. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society relied on internal and external experts to guide the plan's development, to guide their plan's development and ensure best practices. The plan addresses goals pertaining to employees, the nearly 4 million annual visitors to parks, and over 2 million participants in extensive education programs. While the focus of this first phase is on New York City facilities, the dialogue it will expand to include overseas locations in the coming year. At WCS, this plan is the culmination of a year of a year-long effort uh, involving a cross-functional working group of 25 employees, uh, more than 500 employees providing input via focus groups and a survey, and an executive sponsor group. The plan is focused not only on the employee experience, but also on the experiences of visitors and education program participants, regardless of ability or income. So as you've just heard, the creation of these plans was an extensive and costly undertaking. Supplemental funding is necessary to ensure the plans moved forward. In fact, some support has already been provided with great results. The Department of Cultural Affairs hired a consultant for our colleagues in Queens and Staten Island to assist with the development of their plans. The consultant was critical for the Staten Island organizations to have the capacity and expertise to draft plans. Without the support of DCA, the cost of the consultant would have been prohi prohibitive. In fact, the Staten Island-based cultural, Staten Island-based organizations are very hopeful they will receive supplemental funding to continue their work with the consultant to help them advance and execute their year one goals. It bears underscoring that for those organizations without HR or legal staff and with departments of one in many cases, it's extremely challenging to do this important work. We're grateful that the city is providing funds for resources to actualize these plans. In Queens, the eight CIGs worked collaboratively to hire a consultant who uh, helped each organization deal thoughtfully with the issues that were most relevant and important to them. This was made possible through a grant from DCA and the Queens groups were very grateful for the support. In Queens, all the CIGs are enthusiastic about the goals and aspirations underlying the DEI initiative. It is evident that the diversity of the borough itself is a unique resource that the Queens CIGs can refer back to as they move into the implementation phase. Their greatest concern now is in identifying the resources required to achieve the objective in their plans. Uh, and for some CIG institutions, this will mean the addition of staff members. One of the leading strategic priorities that has resulted from New York City Ballet's DEI work is to create the new staff position of Senior Director of Human Resources for Diversity and Inclusion. This individual will provide comprehensive oversight, planning, and management of the human resources functions of the New York City Ballet while pursuing the company's commitment to attract, retain, advance, and support a broadly diverse workforce that thrives in a safe and inclusive environment. 
This individual will also provide ongoing leadership for day-to-day day -day and long-term implementation of the objectives outlined in their DEI plan. The addition of a staff member with this level of expertise and competency is a clear sign of serious investment of the serious investment that the ballet is making in their DEI work. So as you can see, this work is central to the CIG organizations moving forward, but requires significant resources to achieve the best outcomes. Supplemental funding from the DCA to help defray the cost of consultants, and in some cases, new staff members, is crucial. Looking further ahead, fundings for surveys of New York City residents that will help identify barriers to the arts, to arts and culture participation will be needed. This information will be very informative in how each CIG delivers on this important DEI work, yet the cost for any one institution to collect this information is prohibitive. So in closing, on behalf of all of my CIG colleagues, many of whom are here today, I'd like to say it's been truly a privilege to do this important work. Uh, as chair of the CIG DEI uh, subcommittee, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to uh, Sorry, to center the work of all my colleagues around this vital issue and, have moved the, and to have moved the needle in such a significant and concrete way. These plans will help guide our journeys to becoming more accessible and vital institutions and to better reflect the makeup of this amazing city. With robust support from the Department of Cultural Affairs, I'm confident the next phase of our work will be very successful. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Keith, we'll go down the line here from all four, and then if there are any questions for the panel, we'll do sure. it then. Stephanie, do you want to go next? Um, good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Wilchfort, President and CEO of Brooklyn Children's Museum, uh, a community museum in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and the world's first children's museum. We serve 300,000 children and caregivers annually, most of whom hail from our great borough. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to talk about BCM's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Plan, which the museum's Board of Trustees approved last spring to guide our institution's efforts over the next six years. BCM's board uh, formed a DEI committee specifically to do this work and incorporated feedback from the museum's staff and community in considering our goals in four areas, the board of trustees, staff, vendors and procurement, and audience. I want to especially thank DCLA and SMU Data Arts for helping us to establish baseline info in many of these areas and for reviewing our plan and helping us create a really strong effort in this area. Our objective was to create a plan that would ensure meaningful representation of the central Brooklyn communities that we serve in BCM's programs and exhibits, recognizing that over 70% of our audience identifies as non-white, that more than half live in central Brooklyn, and that many of the children we serve have sensory, cognitive, or physical differences. To that end, BCM's plan starts with the following statement. In service to our mission to provide cultural experiences for all children and families, Brooklyn Children's Museum seeks to build an organization that reflects and honors the diversity of our communities and creates a sense of belonging for employees and visitors. BCM endeavors to offer all children, particularly children of central Brooklyn, a fair opportunity to engage in the richness of a museum experience and strives to create a space where families of different backgrounds see themselves reflected in BCM's content. I'm pleased to report that since BCM's DEI plan went into effect last spring, the museum has made strides towards meeting some of our goals. Today, 70% of our employees and four of our seven senior management team members identify as people of color. Four of our seven senior managers are mothers with children six years old or, or younger a particularly critical group to be represented among our ranks, and one which we have actively sought to recruit by ensuring that BCM offers 12 full weeks of paid parental leave. 10% of our staff members identify as LGBTQ, and we have changed our employee handbooks to use gender non-binary language throughout. We have also added six gender-neutral bathrooms, two for staff and, two for and four for visitors. All of our gender-neutral bathrooms for visitors also have changing tables. Over the past year, our board has added nine new trustees, two of whom identify as LGBTQ parents and six of whom identify as non-white. Currently, 46% of our 35-member board identifies as other than white, 10% as LGBTQ, and one quarter live in Brooklyn. These statistics show progress, but we know that this work is never done. Even when we make progress, it must be maintained. And we also know that one of the greatest gains we can make towards equity and inclusion in central Brooklyn is ensuring fair pay. 
increasing salaries, and creating wealth for our employees and community vendors. This takes resources not just for trainings and professional development or DEI committees, but to grow our operations in ways that build capital for our communities. We are incredibly grateful that the New York City Council and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs has supported Brooklyn Children's Museum and arts and culture in the city in so many ways. And we hope that the city will continue to support our DEI work by helping us to ensure that our staff is paid a living wage that honors their hard work by making sure our employees have access to affordable health care, including dental and vision, and by helping ensure that our staffs are supported in their well-being through paid time off and parental leave. Thank you so much for hearing us out thank and you, for Stephanie. hearing more about the DEI plan. Next. Okay. Thank you. Um, Hello, my name is Lisa Gold. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. I am the executive director of the Asian American Arts Alliance, um, which I'm going to call A4 for time's sake. Uh, we are a 36-year-old service organization representing a diverse coalition of artists, arts organizations, and art supporters who believe that working together as a pan-ethnic, multidisciplinary community is essential to nurturing um, the development of artists and arts organizations. So we are dedicated to ensuring greater representation Presentation, equity, and opportunities for Asian American artists and arts organizations, as well as providing a critical voice for our community. Um, I'd like to take this moment first to thank the City Council for um, increasing the Department of Cultural Affairs budget um, and for addressing the issue of diversity in the city's cultural organizations. Um, my concern is um, that organizations that are led by and are serving people of color receive an equitable share of this funding. Um, I understand that the increase should offer support to the Create New York Cultural Plan, um, but I want to know how that support is going to be manifest. How is it going to be implemented, and how is it going to be ensured that it affects our communities proportionately? Um, the Create NYC Cultural Plan is a great, great step. I laud you tremendously for your efforts towards equity. Um, but our constituents need to understand the details of how and what um, will be put in place to serve our communities. Um, we are asking for trans transparency and accountability in the disbursement of those funds. Um, at A4, every single day we work to ensure that our community of artists and arts administrators have the opportunity to fully participate in the city's cultural ecosystem. Um, and it was disheartening to read the SMU uh, Data Arts report that cited only 6% of cultural workers identify as Asian American, while almost 15% of city residents um, identify as Asian American. Conversely, 66% of cultural workers identify as white, non-Hispanic, making up only 32% of the city's population, which you know. Um, but it's also disheartening to see that programmatic funding is disproportionately under-allocated to Asian American-led and Asian American-serving organizations, um, cultural organizations. In the DCLA FY18 budget, which is the data that I had available, um, 937 grantees received over $41 million, yet only 45 of those 937 were Asian American organizations, total of 4.8%. Um, and the total amount of funding for those organizations, it was just over 1.2 million. It's approximately 3% of the DCLA programmatic budget. So in recognition of those issues and statistics, I am making the following suggestions. I have many more, but for time's sake. Um, I would like to ask that um, the Department of Cultural Affairs and the City Council offer unrestricted general operating support to organizations um, because give us the agency to decide how we want to spend the money. If we want to spend it on staff positions, let us decide. Don't cap it at a certain percentage. Um, support funding for paid internships, fellowships, and staff positions at POC-led organizations. I understand the cultural core is huge, but um, it doesn't go far enough. And um, finally, provide more transparency and funding to POC-led and POC-serving organizations. Um, there was great information about in the plan about the SIAP neighborhoods, but there's no documentation to show how that funding is being allocated. So in closing, um, I just want to thank you for your recognition of the important role that arts and um, communities of color play in our cultural ecosystem, and I urge you to take steps to ensure that there's equitable funding for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Rosalind Barber from the Public Theater. Uh, since, since the Public's founding about over 60 years ago, equity, diversity, and inclusion has been at the cornerstone of our mission. Under the leadership of Joe Papp and through the work of subsequent leaders, the Public has been widely recognized for our commitment to respectful, welcoming, and safe spaces in which differences are celebrated both on and off stage. Through our mobile unit, which is traveling, a traveling theater production that tours all five boroughs, and our borough distribution sites for Free Shakespeare in the Park, we reach New Yorkers in every corner of the city from diverse racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. I think you're looking for this. Yes. And also, I just want to take this as an opportunity to thank the City Council and DCLA for the studies that they've produced. They've been enormously helpful in us uh, adjusting the way that we uh, go out to communities outside of the four walls of the public theater and also in engaging our board and staff in the urgency that uh, is needed in addressing these issues. To continue building on, upon this rich history of ambitious and successful work that reflects the values and mission of the institution and the city we serve, the public developed a new equity, diversity, and inclusion plan in 2019 which outlines the goals we intend to achieve by 2023. The plan created in collaboration with board members, staff, and outside experts outlines the following seven goals. Number one, publish EDI statistics in the annual report for the directors and playwrights of downtown season and free Shakespeare in the park performances to demonstrate the public's commitment to consistently presenting work that reflects our goal of creating work that is of, by, and for the people of New York City. Re number two, review and improve human resource processes to ensure equity, diversity, inclusion, values, and goals are prioritized and supported. Number three, achieve goal of ensuring full-time staff is no more than 50% white or 50% cisgender male and ensure diversity is present at all levels of the institution. Number four, achieve goal to create a board that is at least 35% people of color and no more than 50% cisgender male. Number five, establish and begin to implement a plan for creating an inclusive organization for audiences, artists, and staff with disabilities, inclusive of all types of disability and not limited to physical disability. Number six, establish and begin to implement a holistic organizational language plan inclusive of languages other than English. Number seven, establish clear goals and ethical parameters for all learning activity, i.e. internships and fellowships as well as community-centered activity, i.e. community-facing programs, partnerships, and more, that are aligned with the larger public theater mission and are reciprocal in nature. The public intends to achieve these goals by 2023 in order to better reflect the values and mission of our institution and the city we serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have one question for the panel. All of you can take it, or one of you can take it on behalf of the panel, but do you have any reaction to the uh, potential penalty uh, and diminution of funding as a result of the process that the DCLA is entertaining? Uh, sure. Um, speaking on behalf of BAM, certainly, and I, and I hope all of my colleagues, um, uh, Tom used the phrase real and substantial commitment to the plans. That's what they're trying to see, and I'm sure that all 33 of us will, will demonstrate that. We all delivered our plans on time, um, and that involved actually having them approved by our boards. So uh, everybody is, is very supportive of this. I don't expect there to be a penalty ever assessed against any of us, but uh, Tom was correct in that he, he has been telling us about this for a, quite a while now, so it's not gonna be a surprise. Um, uh, and I know that we are, we are all gonna make good faith efforts. Every organization is very different. Um, so, you know, y it's hard to say that, you know, you're gonna assess measurements that are gonna be static across all 33. So I think it's still gonna be a learning process for DCA and for, each in the, each, for all the CIGs together. But um, uh, we're all very aware, um, but we're all taking this work very, very seriously as hopefully is evident to you here today. Anyone else want to weigh in on that or? Yeah, um, I am never in favor of reducing any cultural funding. So, um, and, and to the point made earlier that it could adversely uh, impact communities of color by reducing those positions. Um, I don't necessarily believe that it's the best strategy, so I'm not in favor. Uh, this isn't exactly an answer to your question, but I will say that um, the uh, external sort of 
uh, pressure that's been exerted or just having an outside influence saying, hey, this is important to us and there are real uh, ways that we're asking you to be accountable to it has been really helpful in uh, promoting this work with our board and with our staff so that, you know, our, fortunately for us, our board and staff are already very much interested in this work, but having an additional way to sort of leverage that conversation has been useful. Um, uh, and I think that the cultural plan and the requirement to produce these plans has really helped achieve this. I'll just say one more thing, which is that this really shouldn't be about money. This really, this conversation is really about serving our city, and I think all of us in the CIG feel very strongly that these plans are, we're not putting these plans together to, um, you know, increase our allocations. We're putting these plans together because we know that they will help us serve our communities better. Uh, I appreciate all of you uh, coming here today and testifying and appreciate all the work that you do on behalf of New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Our second and final panel, uh, Jeffrey Omora uh, from Fair Wage on Stage, as well as Robert Stanton from Fair Wage on Stage, uh, Valerie Paley from the New York Historical Society, and Amy Andrew from Mokata. Fair wage, are you doing two testimonies or one? Two, two okay. Why don't you join together so, uh, yes. To, the, to my left and your right, how about that? Yes, you are first. By utilizing our rich and extensive collections of over 14 million objects, New York Historical aims to be an active, accessible community resource for all of the city, but in particular to serve as a destination, in a broader sense, for audiences typically underserved by cultural institutions. Past exhibitions have included Art as act Activism, which showcased protest art for the 1930s through the 1970s, in particular that of the Black Panther Movement, Nueva York, which told the history of the Latino presence in New York, from the 1600s through World War II, Chinese American Exclusion Inclusion, which explored the centuries long history of the Chinese immigrant experience, uh, Stonewall 50 at the New York Historical Society, a suite of three installations currently on view, provides a window into the resistance and nightlife that shaped LBGTQ history. I'm privileged today to represent my institution in speaking of our proactive commitment to diversity. On a personal level, I feel this most seriously as the daughter of a Filipina immigrant, a scholar who might have felt intimidated to darken the door of New York Historical had it even crossed her mind to do so in 1956 when she first arrived in New York City. It is imperative that our exhibitions, collections, and programming reflect the rich cultural fabric of our city and nation. But to do that curatorial and programmatic work, our aim is to ensure that our museum professionals hail from a wide range of backgrounds. In addition to prioritizing women and minority leaders, our Frederick Douglass Council and Women's History Council affinity groups promote deeper discussion and engagement by encouraging support for rich programming in this area. But our work also extends beyond the walls of our museum as we passionately imagine what future cadres of museum professionals could look like. This September, we inaugurated our partnership with the City University of New York's School of Professional Studies to offer a Master of Arts in Museum Studies degree, a unique collaboration and a program which I helped create and implement. Its larger goal is to diversify the city's museum's workforce and address the needs of our increasingly diverse museum-going public. The most successful rollout of a CUNY SPS MA program and the history of the school, our program addresses the pervasive lack of accessibility and inclusion in American museum leadership and curatorial staff, working towards generating an equitable and sustainable cultural workforce of tomorrow. 
The program is specifically structured to attract and retain students from non-traditional academic backgrounds, including working adults and students with family obligations. Although primarily online, the hands-on practicum com component on site at New York Historical will provide a unique behind-the-scenes view of museums' operations. We've launched the program offering scholarship funds and have secured new commitments from Agnes Su Tang and Harold Newman that will allow us to bring the number of scholarship students to 21, with 86% of them from non-white backgrounds. If I uh, can interject, I uh, know you've been jumping around and, and being expeditious with your testimony, because I'm following it. Good. Uh, but if you can uh, find a way to uh, wrap it up uh, uh, and make your final point. Okay, uh, 58 students have registered to date for this inaugural semester with at least as many new applicants anticipated for the program's second cohort in January. Although not all admitted applicants identified their race, 39% identified as coming from non-white backgrounds. Uh, this program will form a vital part of our institutional work towards centering diversity, equity, and inclusion across axes of race, gender, sexuality, and class in all aspects of our operations. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amy Andrew, and I'm here to represent Mokata. Mokata was born from our founder, Lori Cumbo's graduate thesis on the feasibility of whether an African museum could contribute to the revitalization of Brooklyn. Inspired by the Dusab Museum in Chicago, the oldest museum dedicated to African American history in the US, Ms. Cumbo launched Mokata in 1999 in a brownstone in Bed-Stuy. 20 years later, Mokata's mission has grown through three pro programmatic arms, exhibitions, education, and community, thanks to support from DCA and others to use the visual arts as a point of exploration through the experience of the African diaspora, most especially for those who have been systematically left out. Through new artistic productions across a variety of, discipline, a variety of disciplines, we create unique experiences that ex expand beyond the traditional definitions of the term museum to incite dialogue on pressing social and political issues facing the African diaspora and other marginalized communities. As a result, we have a long-standing hi history as an incubator for emerging artists of African descent, including Wangeshi Mutu, uh, Jamel Shabazz, Ava DuVernay, Dred Scott, and many others. I joined this rich legacy of Mokata one year ago as a consultant, hoping to lend my corporate media and international culture expertise to an organization that was and is ready to realize the next level of its growth. What I found in the last 12 months at Mokata and other arts institutions, mainly black arts institutions and those representing other marginalized communities, is that while creative enterprise is not lacking, funding for artists, general operations, whether to maintain current infrastru infrastructure or to scale it, retaining staff and or healthcare, and the rigmarole of maintaining compliance to receive actual funding dollars to stay open, uh, when reserve cash is not always readily available, tend to be among the ongoing concerns when considering longevity. Some fun facts. Researchers examined more than 40,000 artworks in the collections of 18 museums across the U.S., including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. They estimate that 85% of artists represented in these collections are white and 80% men, 87% men, excuse me. For example, the National Art Gallery, uh, there are 986, 986 works by black artists, and of that, uh, I'm sorry, there are 986 works of art created by black artists of the 153,621 total works in the museum. Meanwhile, the Met has hosted eight exhibitions focused on African-American artists in the past 10 years of the about 40 exhibitions they produce every year. Since 2008, just 2.37% of all acquisitions and gifts and gifts, uh, and 7.6% of all exhibitions at 30 prominent American museums have been of work by African American artists, according to a joint investigation by, in other words, and Art News. And yet, over the past decade, purchases and gifts to work by, made by African American artists accounted for a mere 2.4% of all acquisitions. Can I continue? Or wrap it up? As yeah, much as I would. I would uh, it's important, obviously, what you're saying, but if you could find a way sure. to. Um, I'll just say two more points. Uh, today, museums are scrambling to meet this gap in representation, um, to meet this representation, uh, 
and to celebrate contemporary artists who have traditionally been overlooked in the art world, including women of artists of colors. However, these public financial figures, which are great for the greater arts space in general and should be celebrated, are a rarity in the black arts space. We black arts institutions like Mokata never see the likes of these budgets to work on this specific practice of inclusion through its focus, uh, though um, our focus is central, this focus is central to our mission and has been since our inception. As an example, Weeksville Heritage Cultural Site, a, a Brooklyn landmark, almost closed its doors earlier this year, if not for funding. Um, I'm just gonna hurry up to my last paragraph. All this to say that while change is coming at the major mainstream level, and while we are thankful for the support thus far, the work is not complete. More work needs to be done. We cannot forget the institutions who have worked dil diligently to bring about this change through their exhibitions and programming. Institutions who are understand these communities because they are of and from these communities. Make us your partner in training larger institutions who are yet to have a handle on inclusion and diversity. We can no longer ignore the impact of culturally focused institutions for sake of focusing more on gallery size. If there is any suggestion that I might offer to the city and other arts funding institutions and gatekeepers who oversee these decisions is to remember us and other institutions that represent marginalized communities when it comes to grant making time as the legacies we leave behind remain in limbo otherwise. Thank you. How do we increase, is this on? There, there you are. There we go. Uh, how do we increase diversity in cultural institutions? Pay artists more. I'm Jeffrey O'Mara from the labor activist group Fair Wage on Stage. We have some supporters, can you raise your hands? Uh, we're also members of Actors' Equity, the union that represents 20,000 New York City stage managers and actors. More than anywhere in New York's cultural scene, Off-Broadway shines a light on diverse communities. If, you, if you're watching a play, you're most likely to see someone who looks like me off-Broadway, where theaters experiment, take risks, hire artists from diverse backgrounds who aren't household names, and tell stories that reflect the rich demographic tapestry of our city. Companies like Mayi, National Asian American Theater Company, Intar, National Black Theater, and Classical Theater, Theater of Harlem focus specifically on telling stories about communities of color. In recent years, more than half of the actors working at larger off-Broadway institutions like Playwrights Horizons, New York Theater Workshop, Atlantic Theater Company, and Signature Theater were people of color. Off-Broadway fuels one of the largest economic engines of the city, Broadway. The last five shows to win the Tony Award for Best Musical, including Town and Hamilton, began in off-Broadway nonprofit theaters. And these hits helped, helped Broadway sell a record-breaking $1.8 billion in tickets last year alone, generating over $12 billion for the local economy. But that wealth is not reflected in off-Broadway wages. So ironically, as our theaters become more inclusive in the stories they tell, and the artists hired to tell those stories, those from underprivileged communities are shut out. Low wages and high cost of living hit early career artists from working class backgrounds, predominantly those uh, from uh, communities of color, the hardest. And they drive acclaimed actors of every background into debt, bankruptcy, and into leaving the city and the profession altogether. Uh, as with unpaid internships, only those with access to wealth can afford to take these low paying jobs. We need the city's help. We propose the Fair Wage On Stage Fund, and I'd like to introduce Robert Stanton, my fellow actor and activist, who can tell you more about it. Hi. Uh, the Fair Wage On Stage Fund would be an allocation of money within the DCLA budget to make up the difference between the union negotiated minimum salaries nonprofit theaters can afford to pay and what we actually need to survive. In a 2016 union survey, off-Broadway stage managers and actors reported needing $815 a week net just to make ends meet. That's $1,129 before taxes. But only one off-Broadway space pays that much, and many pay much, much less. And Trump's tax law prevents us from claiming expenses that surpass the standard deduction as much as quadrupling our tax burdens. Nonprofit theaters within the five boroughs would be eligible for the fund when they hire contracted equity stage managers and actors at union negotiated minimum salaries that fall below the necessary weekly gross salary of $1,129 per week. Theaters would be responsible for paying established minimums and benefits and could only use the fund to pay the difference between what artists get and what we need. 
Last season, the roughly 1,500 equity contracts at non-Broadway nonprofits paid an average of $646 per week gross. The standard nonprofit employment is nine weeks. The Fair Wage on Stage Fund would subsidize workers on average with $483 per week or $4,347 per contract. We calculate the fund would disperse just around $6.5 million annually. That's less than one one-hundredth of a percent of New York City's $90 billion plus budget. And we've had the privilege to brief you, Chairman Van Bramer, Council Member Espinal and staff members from Council Members Cumbo and Kozlowitz's offices in more detail. We're eager to speak with members Moya and Borelli, and we look forward to working with you to craft this proposal into a budget allocation and or piece of legislation. This fund will signal that no matter what little means we come from, we all deserve a chance to participate in art. Uh, we're not about sticks, we're all about carrots. How do we increase diversity in cultural institutions in the city? We pay artists more. Thank you. Thank you. They almost got in trouble. We're not allowed to clap. We, we, we do this. But, uh, but you got away with it anyway. So, um, uh, uh, so you estimate the total to be uh, six and a half million or so? Yes. Jelly beans in a jar, but yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is. It is a drop in the bucket relative to the 90 some odd billion dollar budget that we have. But uh, we also fight incredibly hard over six and a half million dollars in this city uh, and where it goes. So uh, I've met with, with uh, uh, your group and I'm incredibly sympathetic as someone who loves uh, Broadway uh, uh, and off-Broadway and really appreciate all artists and actors uh, in particular, um, particularly actors who are acting on uh, smaller stages, right, where it is not the Moulin Rouge uh, uh, production situation uh, that my husband and I just saw and we loved. But, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, the, the real real theater that, that you guys, not that that's done, it's great theater, but, uh, and I love musical theater, but, but you know, there's a real heart and a soul to Off-Broadway, right? And like uh, the productions that you're talking about and the work that you're doing, so just re really important stuff. So we have some work to do, mm -hmm. right? To get the political um, uh, will to do that which you suggest, but I, I think uh, we just need to continue the work, obviously. It takes a long time sometimes to get things done uh, in, in this city, but uh, it is a very, very noble uh, cause. Uh, do you want to say something, Jeff? Just want to thank you for, for uh, saying that, and thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you both as well. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here today. It was an important uh, discussion, as uh, Commissioner Finkel Perl called it, but uh, we also need more action behind the talking that we're doing about these issues. So with that, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, sir.